Next month, Spider-Man No Way Home hits theaters, and if all the rumors are true, this looks to be the magnum opus of live action Spider-Man films. So leading up to it, I want to review some of the older Spider-Man films that I haven't reviewed on my channel thus far. Today we're kicking it off with Spider-Man 2002. Let's talk about it. Hi, my name is Sean, and I love to talk about movies way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comments section. Let me know what do you think about Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. My take isn't the right take, it just my take, and I would love to hear yours. Also, as you share your thoughts on the movie, kind of let us know kind of what age range that you're in. Did you see this movie when it first came out in theaters, or were you someone that wasn't even born when this movie came out? It's old enough and also groundbreaking enough that there is kind of a generational divide in how some people respond to this movie. So I'd love to kind of hear your point of reference when it comes to this film. With my spoiler reviews like these ones, I like to give a little bit of background sometimes on the movies. So we're gonna kick this off with the backstory leading up to Spider-Man 2002. And if you're interested in this kind of thing, I actually did a video on canceled Spider-Man movies a couple years back when Far From Home came out. And and I kind of went into detail about a bunch of these canceled Spider-Man projects that were in the works for years and years and years before Spider-Man 2002 came out. But essentially, for over 20 years before this film came out, they were trying to get a live action Spider-Man movie made. In the late 70s, there was a live action Spider-Man TV show, and actually some of the, the pilot episode was released in certain parts of the world as a theatrical film, but after it kind of ran its course, there were some murmurs and attempts to try and make a Spider-Man movie with the Incredible Hulk from the Incredible Hulk TV show. Obviously, it never happened. A few years later, Canon Films got the rights to the Spider-Man character, and they were very excited about cranking out a Spider-Man film, and they put out a bunch of promotional images. They actually put out a little bit of a teaser trailer. Within this unsuspecting city, history's greatest experiment creates tomorrow's greatest superhero, Spider-Man, the movie. A live action spectacular directed by Joe Zito. They did some casting. They built some sets. They were actively, very actively trying to get this movie made. And eventually they started to run into some financial troubles where some movies underperformed and the movie ended up imploding in on itself and so they reused the sets that they had been building for the Spider-Man movie for the Jean-Claude Van Damme film Cyborg. Then in the 90s James Cameron was attached to write and direct a Spider-Man movie and he actually wrote a very long detailed treatment for his Spider-Man film. He did a bunch of concept art for it and all of this stuff is out there. You can read his treatment, you can see his artwork that he was working on for the film, but eventually some rights issues came up and some studio stuff happened. He dropped out of the project, it didn't end up happening. This led eventually to Sam Raimi being hired to make this film. And if you're one of my younger viewers and didn't see this film when it first came out in theaters, it can be a little bit difficult to understand just how important this film was. So back over 20 years before this film came out, Superman 1978 essentially invented the comic book movie blockbuster genre. And then 10 years after that, Batman was another massive hit for the genre. But those movies were made before digital effects existed. All the stuff that we associate with the comic book movie genre with CGI and green screen wasn't really something they had access to when they made those films. In fact, if you have a computer, a $40 green screen, and have just a little bit of knowledge about the Pirate Bay and YouTube tutorials, you have infinite more possibilities to generate effects than they had back when they made those movies. In 1998, Blade came out, and in certain ways, it's the movie that started to kick off the modern digital age of comic book movies. Now, Blade wasn't an A-list character, it wasn't a movie that had a massive budget, but the film was a hit that excited 
fans. Couple years later, X-Men came out. It was a much more well-known property. It had a bigger budget, and it was a much bigger hit film that got people talking about comic book movies again. But then in 2002, Spider-Man was the first mega hit of the modern era, the digital era of comic book films. Spider-Man, of course, is one of the most popular comic book characters of all time. The movie had a massive budget. And 20 years later, it's easy to take for granted how groundbreaking all these shots of Spider-Man swinging through New York City actually were at the time. Now we see this stuff all the time. It's very easy to recreate a city in computers. In fact, you could swing around New York City in two different PlayStation 4 games as Spider-Man. But at the time, we, we'd never seen anything like that before that just felt so immersive and looked so real while seeing something so fantastic and amazing. And so this is a movie that was incredibly important to the genre. It was a massive, gigantic hit. And I think that's a big part of why there's a bit of a generational gap with this one of the people that remember when it came out, how big of a deal it was. If you were in grade school, this is one of the first PG-13 movies you ever saw in the theater. This becomes a formative film for you. Whereas if you watch it now, as a current high schooler, it probably feels a little bit quaint, a little bit outdated. And that's fair, that's fine. You just need to understand how important it was for laying the foundation and building off the foundation of X-Men and Blade to get us to the MCU. With all that said, let's get started with the good. And let's cut right to the chase. I think that this is a great comic book movie that while certain elements about the tone and the effects might not have aged the best, the actual story and storytelling, I think are top notch comic book movie. And a big part of that is that they had a rock solid script from David Cope. This is the screenwriter that adapted Jurassic Park and he'd written Mission Impossible and he's been a major top tier screenwriter for the last 30 years, and he put this script together. Rewatching the movie just a few days ago, right out of the gate, the first 10 minutes is just an example of highly efficient screenwriting, where you kick it off following Peter Parker, and it very effectively walks you through a day in his life. You understand who he is, his place in the social hierarchy. You're introduced to all these other side characters and you meet the Osborne family and you meet Mary Jane and Flash Thompson. All of it while of very quickly getting us to the event where he gets bit by the spider. You understand him. You understand all of the people around him and who who he wants and why he's interested in Mary Jane. You understand his friendship with uh, Harry Osborn, and then with Harry Osborn meeting Peter Parker, you immediately realize that Norman Osborn respects Peter Parker more than his own son, and you therefore you understand the dynamic between Harry and Norman Osborn, and all of this is set up while moving the plot forward quickly. And that's what good screenwriting does. It's able to do multiple things at the same time while not just being clunky exposition. You're telling a story, you're moving things forward, but we're also learning all the information about the characters that we need to know and getting to the point quickly and efficiently. Now, if you're familiar with my channel, you probably know that I love origin stories, stories of becoming, where you introduce a character in a fairly normal situation and then you have extraordinarily extraordinary things happen to them that shapes them into a hero. And part of that is gaining powers, part of that is getting the skill set to be the hero, and the other side to it is that character arc of what shapes the person behind the mask to be able to be the hero. And I think with this movie, they just very wisely did a classic version of Spider-Man's origin story. They trusted the source material that has been winning over children and teenagers and adults for now 60 years. And you can almost go panel by panel kind of tracking along with the different moments, but it's all the classic beats about him as this nerdy kid 
gets bit by the spider and starts gaining powers and he acts kind of like a teenager would that's just goofing around with all of it. And then he tries to use it for personal gain and goes to this wrestling match. All of this has roots in the comic book source materials, in the comics, um, leading to the moment where he lets someone go. He didn't listen to that classic line. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. He didn't learn that lesson when he was just told it. And he lets the robber get by only to learn that that robber killed Uncle Ben. And in that moment, that simple lesson that so defines the Spider-Man character, he gets it. I've been given something. And because I didn't accept that responsibility soon enough, I lost the person that means the most to me. And I don't want that to happen again. And this chooses to use his powers for good. As this compelling, classic hero's journey, classic superhero type stuff of the person that has to be transformed on the inside to become the hero on the outside. And, you know, Spider-Man has kind of a very much classic type of story of someone that gains powers, but they still need that triggering event for them to get it. It has all the beats, and it's, in a certain sense, so relatable of such a normal character being put in such spectacular and awesome situations. And I think this movie just is able to lean right into the formula in a way that the Tom Holland film wasn't able to because it had already been done two times before in the previous 15 years. And so we still kind of, we have a Peter Parker in the Tom Holland films that we don't know anything about his uncle Ben. We haven't seen a bunch of stuff in that story. It hasn't been played out quite yet. Um, And you get the origin to kind of know what did change about him. And with this Tobey Maguire version, you get to see that transformation. Along those same lines is that you, they play Peter Parker. Tobey Maguire plays Peter Parker as kind of a classic nerdy outcast. That you get this immediately in the film. His place in society that people don't, he, he's picked on because he's nerdy. And it bugs him. And in a certain sense, he's kind of still kind of clueless. Or like he doesn't want people to pick on him. Um, But it's not like he's a brooding character. He's just kind of in his own world, taking pictures into nerdy stuff and pining over a girl that doesn't seem to care much that he exists just yet. And you see him, like, get who he is immediately in his place in the school and around him. Thus, as he gains powers and gains confidence through that, starts to know who he is, becomes a better version of himself you see his place in society shift in the way people relate to him and the way he relates to others, the way he's willing to talk to Mary Jane. Like you have a strong actual character arc there. Kind of going back to the Tom Holland version where you don't have some of that with that version. Like he does, that version does a lot of things great, but you don't see the transformation of who he was. Feels like he, it, some of that's also the nature of how high school dynamics and things have shifted over the last 20 years, especially over the last 60 years. But, you know, he, he never comes off like an outcast. Like Flash Thompson picks on him a little bit, but it seems like they're actually kind of equals in the hierarchy of their social dynamics in the Tom Holland films. Whereas here you really see someone that just has this one friend, Harry, who himself is an outcast for different reasons. And they connect for kind of this odd friendship because of that. But through the course of the film, through becoming Spider-Man, Peter Parker also becomes that better version of himself. Another thing that I think this movie does really well, um, it it does lead to problems, but the way that it, it tells its story, it covers quite a bit of time. Because it's going through this classic origin story of him in high school, him becoming spider or getting the powers, but not becoming Spider-Man yet. And then you, you have him learning the lesson through the death of Uncle Ben. Then you have kind of this time jump as you realize, I need to be a hero. I need to build a costume. So then he starts, uh, it montages through kind of his initial segment of time where he, he starts to um, use his powers and graduates high school. And it, it just covers a lot of time throughout the film. And it's about a, maybe a year of time passes in this film, maybe even more than that. And it doesn't need to put on the screen <clears throat> one year later. You understand what's happening because the script and direction makes it clear. You understand early on, they are in high school 
And then you see them graduate. That's you, you very much get time has passed. And then you montage him doing certain things. And when he runs into Mary Jane after she's been working and clearly their two people are playing catch up. So a lot of time has passed since graduation. Like it's just a well-written script that knows how to communicate a lot of information without needing to pause and say, well, I have not seen you in two years since we graduated from high school. No, it, it just does not in a way that you, you're, the scene is designed to show them her seeing him in a different light and him having more confidence with her and talking to her in a more normal sense and that relationship building while also giving us information about what's going on with her and Harry while also letting us know time has passed. It's just really nicely written and the whole movie does a good job of passing a lot of time without needing to tell us in a weird way that that happened, without needing to dump a bunch of exposition. No, it shows us stuff and catches us up with scenes that cover a lot of ground effectively. Another thing that I think elevates this film is that it spends a lot of time developing the villain, where you have a full arc and development of Norman Osborn's character. You see him at the beginning and you understand kind of his relationship with his son, his driven nature as the businessman, he's a risk taker, and you see that he's has this conflict put in front of him that he might lose the funding. And so he's he risks things on himself. And it spends a bunch of time with him showing us the moments where he feels like he was wronged. And because he has this stuff in, himself, in him making him a little bit crazy and giving him a split personality, he turns into the Green Goblin. And you see that journey. The other thing that's important about it is that... Willem Dafoe is awesome. He's just a great actor. And the tone of this movie allows him to just eat up every scene that he is in and just go for it. And so you have these scenes where he's talking to himself and like looking in a mirror and he's playing both sane Norman Osborn and Green Goblin, crazy Osborn, in the same shot. And you see him transitioning back and forth between the crazy and the normal. And that's the stuff that, like, it's where you know someone is like a top tier actor that in their brain they can do a performance that transitions between those two things. And it's so good. And the tone of the film allows it, allows him to do things that it's just cartoonish enough, it's just hyper-elevated enough that he can go crazy, and he can go crazy, and it's awesome, and it just shows how good he is and how strong of a performer he is. And like I said, another piece to that is because we spend so much time with him establishing him at the beginning and gives us a baseline of normal Harry, uh, normal Norman and normal his relationship to... Harry and other people around him and his kind of more charming, affable side, but still the way that kind of a prick towards his son. And you see that driven side, his insecurities, his vindictiveness that's driven crazy by everything. And so then when you get to the Thanksgiving dinner where he's just being a total jerk, that actually is, you're seeing the descent into madness to where he can't even control anymore which one is which and which version of his image is being present. You actually have an arc, a transition for the villain that's developed where you, you don't necessarily feel bad for him. He's not sympathetic per se, but you see how far he has fallen to the point that when he dies and he says, don't tell Harry. <laughs> you understand where that's coming from. And it sets up so much of that dynamic between Peter and Harry and Spider-Man and Harry throughout the next two films. The other great performance in here is J.K. Simmons is J. Jonas Jameson. So much so that as much as the continuities have been rebooted and we had multiple Spider-Man and all these other characters, we have to recast them. J. Jonah Jameson, that's the one where he returned in the MCU to be the person to out Peter Parker as Spider-Man. He's just so good at the role and just embodies this character. And I, I actually love that the characterization, in a certain sense, it's fairly straightforward. He doesn't really have an arc. 
He's the guy that just hates Spider-Man, wants to sell newspapers, but it's, it's like a consistent worldview. But he's also not just self-interested. He has this moment where Green Goblin shows up at his office, holding him up by his throat. He has every reason he gives to be like, that guy sold me the pictures right over there. Green Goblin only wants to know who, how to get to Spider-Man. He wants to know the photographer. And J. K., uh, J. Jonah Jameson will not give up his photographer. Like there's like that, he's a character that in that one simple moment, you're able to give him so much more depth than just kind of the angry news reporter guy that wants to sell things, sell newspapers and wants to hard bargain. Like, but he's also not someone that's just throwing other people under the bus. I love that little detail. Then real quick, let's talk about our young cast here. Of course, you got Tobey Maguire in the lead, who is like 26 years old when he shot this movie. So he's too old to be playing a high schooler, but because he's able to sell the nerdy side to it, the outcast side to it, that it somehow fits in the movie and works, and you don't really notice the fact that like that guy doesn't actually look like he's in high school because you buy into the other stuff. And it, it's a sort of performance that isn't what you would do in a comic book movie now. It wouldn't fit in the MCU the way the way we understand it. And at the same time, it fits the Sam Raimi somewhat campy tone, but also it takes itself seriously. Like it has this melodramatic side to it. You of course has the big action, but it has like it does have a campy vibe to it. In that's where I think Tobey Maguire fits nicely into what they're trying to do here. Then we got uh, James Franco as Harry Osborne. And it's interesting because like, this is the first thing where I saw him. And he's gone on to become like this big, gigantic actor that's done a ton of things and actually directed movies. And, and so this was actually my baseline for understanding him. So when he started doing more comedic roles later on, it was actually a bit of a transition to like, wait, well, Harry is such a serious character. Now that he's doing comedy, what, what's kind of going on here? But, you know, I, I think he, he works as this guy that is in one sense very selfish, narcissistic, and he's thinking about what's good for him. But he does care about his friend, but he doesn't care about enough about his friend to not steal the girl that he knows that his friend is interested in. And so there's all this interesting, it's like a character that has a lot of layers to him and complexity and how he relates to the people around him and how, how he does care, but he also can't let go of his own selfishness in a lot of these moments. Then we got Kirsten Dunst as Mary Jane, and the characterization is pretty different from the classic Mary Jane from comics, previous cartoons. And so it, it is a reworking of the character, but I think it fits into the story that's kind of being told here, where she is a, a softer personality that I think fits with where this Peter Parker is at. Like, so not a great translation of the comic book character to the big screen, but does it fit the movie? And, and I, I think it does for how he's being characterized, visualized here in the love triangles. Actually, it's, it's love squared in a certain sense because you have both Harry, Peter, and Spider-Man all fighting for her affection in the film. So I, maybe it's because I, I just thoroughly enjoy the film. Worked for me. I think I, there has been some criticism of her, but I think a lot of that goes back to the, the writing changes the character more so than she did something wrong with it. From there, I talked about this a little bit, but it is a movie that I think revolutionized um, comic book movie action because the technology was suddenly there where you could show bigger things that are moving faster, that are just more convincing than anything that you could ever see before. And so you can have these CGI spots, shots of Spider-Man swinging through the Big Apple and they just look amazing. And then a lot of the other stuff, sequences, when you get to the actual action, it is on practical sets. So it kind of combines, I think, the best of both worlds where you're on a practical set where you see actual things moving and blowing up and debris falling on them. And then being able to combine that with then CGI shots, enhanced shots of swinging that just makes the scope size of the city seem so much bigger and more real and lived in. Um, and when you put the two together, I think you get something really special. And finally, you have to talk about Danny Elfman's score on this one. And I, I think it's one of the great comic book movie scores of all time. It's just kind of one of those, those magic pieces of music that perfectly captures the character, captures the emotion. It's iconic. It's memorable. It's heroic. It's everything that you want a, a comic book movie score to be. And I think the other thing that's, uh, in particular, I think stands out to me is that Danny Elfman has certain Elfman-isms 
where some of his scores bleed together a little bit with the way he does some orchestration and you know he did like the score for the flash tv show he did the score for dick tracy both of those ones are very reminiscent of the batman 89 score but when you get to this one well you can certainly tell it is an elfman score it stands out, it's unique, and doesn't at all feel like he's just borrowing his old bag of tricks. No, he brought a great piece of music that absolutely fits Spider-Man, this story, and is just one of the great pieces of music inside of the comic book movie genre. So when you put it all together, for me, I think it's a great origin story. It's a great classic version of of Spider-Man that big part of what makes it work is that you have a strong developed hero but also a villain that is equally well developed where you care about what's happening to both of them so when they come into conflict you actually feel something the characters are interesting they're fun to watch and it was a groundbreaking film that was able to do things that, we, that we'd never seen before and so I think that this is a great comic book movie and a great Spider-Man movie. From there, let's move on to the mixed aspects because of the film. From there, let's move on to the mixed aspects of the film. The big thing here is that now that we've had like a hundred more Marvel comic book movies since this movie came out, this one starts to feel a little bit dated. This movie broke ground, it set the template, it helped us understand how to bring these characters into big blockbusters and balance the comic booky, the cartoonish, the melodrama, the human aspects, the fantastic. It's so important to the genre, but they have improved on a lot of that stuff. Of course, technology, CGI, all of that is dramatically improved over the last 20 years, but just also in how to do the tone right, how to do humor without getting goofy, how to have the cartoonish aspects without being campy. There are things about this movie that haven't aged all that well. There's some effects that if you're not used to kind of older practical effects and sets, they can look artificial to you, where to me is someone that grew up on watching practical sets, that stuff looks more real to me than CGI stuff. If you're used to, if your eyes are adjusted and you're learning to love movies to CGI sets and enhanced sets like that, then they, they look probably a little bit small scale and goofy and contained to you. So there's things about it that are, that are dated. That's not something that hurts the movie for me. I do understand though when someone that was born in 2003 or 1998 and they just didn't grow up watching some of these movies. They did grow up watching the MCU. By comparison, this feels like a relic of the past. That was an important stepping stone to get where we're at, but where we're at is a dramatic improvement on what came before. I get that perspective. That's not the way that I see it. From there, let's move on to the bad. And the big thing that comes to mind here for me is that because they are telling a story that covers so much time and giving origin story of both a hero and a villain and doing kind of some of these time jumps and montages the way it plays out there's not always a lot of urgency the stakes aren't particularly big and so it it while it's telling a story that's compelling it doesn't feel as big as so many films that have come since and in particular you have a plot where green goblin is primarily just out to get people that have wronged him. And so then he takes out the military people and then he takes out the Oscorp board. Out am I? But when he takes out the Oscorp board, Spider-Man shows up and therefore then Spider-Man becomes the next person that has wronged Green Goblin, Norman Osborn. So then he's out for revenge against him. So as you move into the back 40% of the film, Spider-Man's not trying to stop and hunt down Green Goblin. Green Goblin is trying to hunt down and stop Spider-Man. And so I, I just kind of the nature of the way that story plays out is a little bit clunky in the way that it happens. And um, it, it gets a little bit kind of episodic in the way that it does some of the stuff where like Green Goblin shows up at the newsroom and it's like he just blows up 
part of a building and picks up J. Jonah Jameson. And then you have this segment where he shows up at a place that's on fire and then he shows up and messes with Aunt May. And so it's just kind of a lot of kind of these little sequence type things that as opposed to doing quick little bits of him showing up doing something small that probably would have worked better to, I don't know, structure that differently, tell that story differently, that creates a scenario to where maybe Spider-Man's trying to stop him from something evil rather than him messing around with Spider-Man for like 40 minutes of runtime in a way that's, it's kind of weird when it's like three different things of like, hey, got you to show up. Hey, let's talk real quick. Wait, you're not going to be on my side? Well, then I'm managing and to mess with you a little bit more. Just, just a, kind of a weird way to structure that. And I think somewhat along those same lines, um, while I appreciate how much time it covers and I think it does a pretty good job at it, there are, are there are a couple of ways about that that, you know, he, he becomes Spider-Man or he decides to be Spider-Man and it montages him becoming Spider-Man. So you don't pause to experience the first time that he really decides, I'm going to put on the costume and fight crime. It montages it. And so I think there's like a moment there that could be really cool where, wait, with great power comes great responsibility. And you show the first time that he decides he's going to go and stop a robber and he's clumsy or something like that. But he defeats the person as this moment of realization like, this is what I'm supposed to, to do. This is what I'm going to be. So show that one and then montage him as he kind of grows in fame and people start becoming aware of him. But it doesn't do that. It kind of like does a montage of him like drawing things and graduating and then montage of him fighting a bunch of crime. And so I, I think just like there's a way that I think could have done that, have a little bit more weight to it than just kind of just montaging through all of it. And then finally, the Green Goblin costume looks stupid. Um, it didn't look great when it came out. Um, and it's in particular bad when you look at some of the DVD behind the scenes footage and they had this idea of doing kind of like a, a prosthetic head. There's more comic book accurate things that they could have done. And it seems like any other option would have been better than this solid state helmet. It just, it, did, it just wasn't the right direction to go. And the design of the helmet actually is basically something from Army of Darkness from Sam Raimi's film from about 10 years earlier. It's just a weird direction to go. A strange choice that that's what they decided to do with it when they worked on some other stuff and they could have done just like the hood over the head and kind of hide his appearance or something like, no, let's do a solid metal helmet that looks pretty ridiculous. And so wish they hadn't have done that. And I'm curious what they're actually going to do in Spider-Man No Way Home uh, and like, you get the picture of him on the new poster that they put out just a few days ago and you could kind of get a glimpse of what he looks at, but not really. So I'm curious, are they really going to keep that helmet the way it was or are they going to update it to, to make it look better than it did? But, you know, those are a couple things that bug me a little bit about the film because this is a you know long spoiler review. At the end of the day, I think the movie works. I think it's great. And even with my little gripes here and there, they're mostly just nitpicks. All right, real quick, before I give you my final score on this one, be sure to join me down below in the comment section. Let me know, what do you think about Spider-Man 2002? And be sure to give me that context. Did you see it in the theater? Are you kind of one of my younger viewers? Give your perspective on where you're coming from with this film. Also, I've done a ton of Spider-Man content in the past. You can check out my playlist of rankings and stuff right up here. I do plan on doing a bunch more Spider-Man reviews over the next couple of months. So if you're watching in the future, you can check those out up here. And once Spider-Man No Way Home comes out, I plan on updating all of my Spider-Man rankings. So there's gonna be lots of Spider-Man content for the next two months. And I'm excited to watch them, especially because nowadays I can watch all of them with my kids and talk about them with us. Pretty cool to get to do that. And I get to talk with all of you wonderful people. While this movie might be a little bit dated for younger viewers, I think this is a great comic book movie. It's a spectacular Spider-Man movie that I love. And I think it's one of the best Spider-Man movies and a great example of how to do a classic version of a comic book origin story and get the tone right. Overall, I'm giving this one an A on the entertainment scale. I'm going 9 out of 10, and I think this is a must-watch for Spider-Man or comic book movie 
fans. If you enjoyed this video, I've got more like it. Check out my Spider-Man rankings right over there. You can check out my Spider-Man reviews right down there. And over the next couple of months, I'll be adding a bunch more to that playlist right there. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.